I'd been a park ranger for over a decade, and days like this were my favorite. The world seemed so peaceful, so untouched by the hustle and bustle of the cities far away. That day, I was assigned to do a routine check of one of the more remote parts of the park. It was an area few visitors ventured into because the trails were rough and the forest was thick. But I didn't mind. In fact, I relished the solitude, the feeling of being alone with nature. I packed my gear, grabbed my binoculars, and set out on my usual route. The trail was quiet, save for the occasional rustling of leaves or the distant call of a hawk. I walked slowly, taking in the sights and sounds, making sure everything was as it should be. There was something comforting about the routine, the familiarity of the job. As I moved deeper into the woods, the trees grew taller and the underbrush thicker. It was as if the forest was wrapping itself around me, welcoming me into its depths. It was one of those places where the trees parted just enough to let in a flood of sunlight, turning the grass below into a soft, glowing carpet. I stopped for a moment to catch my breath and take in the view. I pulled out my binoculars to scan the area, something I did out of habit more than anything. Usually, I'd spot a deer or two, maybe a fox if I was lucky. But that day, something was different. As I raised the binoculars to my eyes, I noticed movement at the edge of the clearing, just beyond the tree line. At first, I thought it was a bear. We had plenty of them in the park, and they often wandered into clearings to forage for food. But as I focused the binoculars, I realized this was no bear. It was enormous, with broad shoulders and long arms that hung almost to its knees. My heart skipped a beat. I'd heard the stories, of course. Everyone had. The legends of Bigfoot or Sasquatch roaming the forests, eluding capture, and leaving behind nothing but giant footprints and blurry photographs. But I'd never put much stock in them. They were just stories, something to entertain tourists or spook kids around a campfire. But here I was, staring at something that matched the description perfectly. The creature was moving slowly, almost cautiously, as if it knew it was being watched. It glanced around, its head turning in my direction for just a moment. I couldn't see its face clearly, but I could tell it was aware of me. My hands trembled slightly as I adjusted the binoculars, trying to get a better look. Was this really happening? Could it be? I considered reaching for my camera, but I was too afraid of making any sudden movements. The creature didn't seem aggressive, but it was so large, so powerful looking, that I didn't want to take any chances. I just stood there, frozen, watching as it slowly made its way across the clearing and disappeared back into the trees. For a long moment, I didn't move. I just stood there, staring at the spot where the creature had vanished, my mind racing. What had I just seen? Was it really a Sasquatch? Or was it something else? A trick of the light, maybe? Or could it have been a bear, after all, seen from a strange angle? But deep down, I knew it wasn't. I'd seen enough bears in my time to know what they looked like, how they moved. This was different. When I finally gathered the courage to lower my binoculars, my hands were still shaking. I took a deep breath, trying to calm myself down. This was just another day on the job, I told myself. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd witnessed something extraordinary, something few people ever got the chance to see. I continued my patrol, but my mind wasn't on the job anymore. All I could think about was the creature. Should I tell someone? Report what I'd seen? But who would believe me? The Park Service had always been strict about keeping things scientific, factual. They didn't have much patience for stories about mythical creatures. And besides, what proof did I have? I hadn't taken a picture, hadn't collected any evidence. All I had was my word, and that didn't seem like enough. By the time I finished my rounds and made it back to the ranger station, the sun was already setting. The shadows were growing long and the air had a cool bite to it. I sat down at my desk and tried to write up my report but I couldn't focus. 
My mind kept drifting back to the creature, the way it had moved, the way it had looked at me. In the end, I decided not to mention it in my report. I still remember the night so clearly. It was one of those evenings when the sky seemed to stretch on forever, with stars twinkling like diamonds scattered across a dark velvet blanket. My name is Jonah, and my friend Emily and I are astrologers. We spend most of our nights watching the skies, looking for signs in the stars and planets. But that night, we saw something we never expected. Emily and I had driven out to our favorite spot, a special place in the woods far from the city lights. We liked it because the sky was always so clear and we could see everything perfectly. We set up our telescopes and spread out a blanket to sit on. The air was cool and the only sounds were the rustling of leaves and the occasional hoot of an owl. As the night went on, we talked about the stars and what they might mean. Emily pointed out the constellations, telling me stories about how they got their names. It was peaceful, just like any other night. But then something strange happened. Emily suddenly fell silent. I looked over at her, and she was staring at the edge of the woods, her eyes wide. Jonah, she whispered, do you see that? I followed her gaze and saw a shadowy figure standing just beyond the tree line. At first I thought it might be a deer, or maybe a person, but it didn't move like anything I'd ever seen. It was tall and thin, with long arms that hung down to the ground. Its eyes were glowing in the darkness like two bright spots of light. What is that? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. I don't know, Emily replied, her voice trembling. But we should go. Now. We started packing up our things as quickly and quietly as we could. But as we did, the figure stepped out of the woods and into the clearing. It moved in a way that was unnatural, its limbs bending in ways that didn't seem possible. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I could feel Emily trembling beside me. Just as we were about to leave, the creature let out a low, growling sound. It wasn't like any animal I'd ever heard. It was deep and eerie like the sound was coming from somewhere far beneath the ground. My legs felt like they were made of lead, but I forced myself to move. We needed to get out of there. Emily grabbed my arm, and we ran to the car as fast as we could. I could hear the creature's footsteps behind us, heavy and deliberate. I didn't dare look back. We jumped into the car and I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking so badly I could hardly get them into the ignition. Finally, the engine roared to life, and I slammed on the gas. The tires squealed as we sped away, the creature's glowing eyes still burning in my mind. I didn't slow down until we were miles away, and even then I didn't feel safe. When we got back to Emily's house, we locked all the doors and windows. We didn't talk about what we saw, not right away. We were too scared, too shaken to put it into words. It wasn't until the next day that we finally sat down and tried to make sense of it. Do you think it was a skinwalker? Emily asked, her voice barely audible. I had heard stories about skinwalkers before. They were creatures from Native American legends, shapeshifters who could take the form of animals or even other people. But I had never believed in them. They were just stories, something to scare children around a campfire. But what we saw didn't feel like a story. It felt real. I don't know, I said, shaking my head. But whatever it was, it wasn't natural. We never went back to that spot. In fact, we stopped going out to the woods altogether. The stars didn't seem as important after that night, not when we knew what was out there. I've always loved the woods, the way the trees sway in the breeze, the sound of leaves crunching under my boots, the feeling of being alone with nature. It's where I go when I need to clear my head. But this time, I wasn't alone. This time, I brought my cat, Whiskers. Whiskers isn't your average cat. 
He's a black and white furball with a big personality. He's curious about everything and loves to explore. So when I decided to spend a weekend in the woods, I thought, why not bring Whiskers along? He'll enjoy the adventure. We arrived at the trailhead early in the morning. The sun was just starting to peek over the mountains, casting a golden glow on the trees. Whiskers was in his carrier, peeking out through the mesh window, his green eyes wide with excitement. I could tell he was just as eager as I was to get started. We set off on the trail, the air cool and fresh. Whiskers purred contentedly in his carrier as I hiked along, enjoying the peacefulness of the forest. The trees towered above us, their branches forming a canopy that filtered the sunlight into dappled patterns on the ground. Birds chirped in the distance, and every now and then, a squirrel would dart across the path, catching Whiskers' attention. After a few hours of hiking, we reached a small stream. It seemed like the perfect spot to set up camp. I found a flat patch of ground and pitched my tent while Whiskers explored the area, sniffing at the plants and batting at fallen leaves. I laughed as he pounced on a particularly crunchy leaf, his tail flicking with excitement. Once the tent was set up, I gathered some wood and started a fire. The sun was beginning to set, and the sky was painted with shades of orange and pink. I cooked a simple dinner over the fire and shared a piece of cooked fish with Whiskers, who purred loudly in approval. As the night fell, the woods became quiet, except for the crackling of the fire and the occasional hoot of an owl. I sat by the fire, staring up at the stars that twinkled through the gaps in the trees. Whiskers curled up beside me, his fur warm and soft against my leg. It was peaceful, the kind of night that makes you forget about everything else. But then, something changed. Whiskers suddenly lifted his head, his ears perked up, and his eyes locked onto the darkness beyond the firelight. His fur bristled, and a low hiss escaped his throat. I frowned, following his gaze into the shadows, but I couldn't see anything. What is it, buddy? I asked, trying to soothe him, but he kept hissing, his body tense and alert. It was then that I felt it, a sense of unease, like the air around us had grown heavier. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and a chill ran down my spine. I stood up slowly, scanning the darkness. The firelight didn't reach far, and the woods beyond were pitch black. I couldn't see anything, but I could feel it. Something was out there, watching us. Come on, Whiskers, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. I reached down to pick him up, but he didn't budge. He was frozen in place, staring into the darkness, his hissing growing louder. My heart raced as I tried to peer into the shadows, but all I could see were trees and darkness. Then, I heard it. A rumbling growl that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. It was deep and menacing, the kind of sound that sends a jolt of fear through your entire body. I felt my blood run cold. I knew that sound. It was the sound of something dangerous, something not of this world. A hellhound. I had heard stories about hellhounds before, giant black dogs with glowing red eyes, creatures that haunt the night and bring death to those who cross their path. I had always dismissed them as just that, stories. But now, standing in the dark woods with that growl echoing around me, I wasn't so sure. Whiskers yowled, his claws digging into the ground as he tried to back away. I didn't need any more convincing. Whatever was out there, I wasn't sticking around to find out. I grabbed Whiskers and stuffed him into his carrier, not caring how much he protested. My hands shook as I fumbled with the zipper, but I managed to get it closed. I quickly doused the fire with dirt and kicked dirt over the embers, smothering the flames. The darkness closed in around us, and the growling grew louder, closer. My heart pounded in my chest as I swung the carrier onto my back and grabbed my pack. We're leaving, I said to Whiskers, my voice trembling. I turned and started down the trail, moving as fast as I could in the dark. I didn't dare look back. I just kept moving, my feet pounding the dirt path, my breath coming in short, panicked gasps. Whiskers was silent in his carrier, but I could feel him trembling. 
I pushed myself to move faster, but the darkness made it difficult to see, and I stumbled over roots and rocks. Then, just when I thought the growling couldn't get any closer, it stopped. The silence was so sudden, so complete, that it was almost deafening. I froze, listening, my heart hammering in my chest. But there was nothing. No growl, no footsteps, nothing but the sound of my own ragged breathing. I didn't know if the hellhound had given up or if it was just waiting, watching. I didn't want to find out. I forced myself to keep moving, slower now, careful not to make any noise. The trail seemed to stretch on forever, but finally I saw the faint glow of dawn on the horizon. I didn't stop until I was inside the car with the doors locked. Only then did I let out the breath I had been holding. Whiskers peeked out of his carrier, his green eyes wide with fear, but the hissing had stopped. I reached in and scratched behind his ears, trying to calm him and myself. It's okay, buddy. We're safe now, I whispered. I started the car and drove away, leaving the woods behind. I didn't look back. Whatever was out there, I didn't want to see it again. And as for Whiskers, well, I think he'll be staying home on my next adventure. I never thought I'd end up in a place like this. It all started with a simple assignment, just another job at a secret facility hidden deep in the woods, far from any town. I had been working for the government for a few years, doing odd tasks here and there. This one seemed no different at first. The facility was nothing special on the outside, just an old rundown building with a few security guards. But inside, it was like stepping into a different world. The halls were lined with heavy steel doors, each one locked tight. The air was cold and still, like the place hadn't seen the sun in years. I didn't ask questions. I'd learned not to. You do your job, you get paid, and you move on. My job was simple. Make sure the place stayed clean and secure. But something was off from the beginning. The guards were nervous, always on edge. They didn't talk much, just nodded when I passed by. The scientists were worse, barely looking up from their work, their faces pale and drawn. I figured they were just tired, maybe stressed from whatever experiment they were running. I didn't know, and I didn't care to find out. It was about a week into my assignment when I first noticed something strange. One of the rooms, always locked tight, suddenly had a red light flashing above it. I'd never seen that before, and it made my stomach churn. I asked one of the guards about it, but he just shook his head and told me to stay away. It's above your pay grade he said, and that was the end of it. But I couldn't stop thinking about it. Something was wrong, I could feel it. The next day, the red light was still flashing, but now there were voices coming from inside, muffled, but panicked. I tried to ignore it, telling myself it wasn't my business. But curiosity got the better of me. When I was sure no one was looking, I crept closer to the door, pressing my ear against the cold metal. I couldn't make out much. They were talking about a creature, something they had found or created. I wasn't sure. But whatever it was, it wasn't supposed to be here. And it was sick. Containment breach, one of the voices said, trembling with fear. We have to get rid of it before it spreads. I didn't wait to hear more. I backed away, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't know what they were dealing with, but I knew enough to understand it was dangerous. I decided then and there that I needed to leave, but it wasn't that simple. You couldn't just walk out of a place like this. You needed clearance, a reason, and I had neither. So I kept my head down, going about my duties, trying to act normal. But the atmosphere had changed. The scientists were more frantic, whispering in corners, shooting nervous glances at the locked door. The guards were jumpy, their hands never far from their weapons. And then, it happened. 
The alarms blared, loud and piercing, shaking the walls. Red lights flashed all around, and a voice over the intercom ordered everyone to evacuate. I was in the middle of the hall when the door to that room flew open. Two scientists burst out, their faces pale with terror. Get to the incinerator, one of them shouted, clutching a metal briefcase. We have to destroy it. I froze, unsure of what to do. But then I saw it. A shadow in the doorway, something moving, slithering out into the hall. It was too dark to see clearly, but I could tell it wasn't human. It was too big, too twisted. My breath caught in my throat as it turned its head, or whatever it had, toward me. I ran. I didn't know where I was going, just away from that thing. The halls were chaos, people running, shouting, trying to escape. But the exits were sealed, locked down by the emergency protocols. There was no way out. The only place to go was the incinerator, a massive furnace at the heart of the facility. I knew where it was, but I had never been there before. It was a place of last resort, used to destroy anything too dangerous to keep. I never thought I'd see it in use, but now it was my only chance. I wasn't the only one who thought so. The scientists were already there, frantically working to open the furnace. The creature was close behind, slithering, crawling, moving in ways that shouldn't have been possible. It was like something out of a nightmare, a mix of limbs and eyes and mouths, all twisted together in a grotesque form. But it wasn't just its appearance that terrified me. It was the sickness, the virus they had mentioned. I could feel it in the air, thick and choking, like a poison spreading through the facility. Whatever this thing was, it was a carrier, and if it got out, the world would never be the same. The scientists managed to get the furnace open just as the creature reached them. They didn't stand a chance. It tore through them like they were nothing, scattering their remains across the floor. But in the chaos, the briefcase had fallen, sliding across the floor toward me. I didn't think. I grabbed it and ran for the furnace. The heat was unbearable, the air shimmering with it. But I didn't care. I had to destroy whatever was in that briefcase, whatever they had been so desperate to protect. I threw it into the flames, watching as it was consumed in seconds. But it wasn't enough. The creature was still there, still moving, and I knew what I had to do. I turned and ran for the emergency override, slamming my hand down on the button. The door to the incinerator began to close, sealing the creature inside. It let out a scream, a sound that echoed through the halls, a mix of rage and pain and something else, something almost human. But it was too late. The door slammed shut, and the furnace roared to life. I watched through the small window as the flames engulfed the creature, burning it away to nothing. The screams faded, replaced by the crackling of the fire. It was over. The alarms stopped, the red lights faded, and the facility fell silent. I stood there, staring at the furnace, trying to process what had just happened. I had no idea what that creature was, where it came from, or what kind of virus it carried. But I knew one thing. It was gone, and the world was safe. For now. I walked through the empty house, holding my camera steady as I filmed each room. The place was perfect for a young family, big windows, a cozy fireplace, and a large backyard. It was my job as a realtor to make sure everything looked inviting in the video, so I took my time, making sure to capture every detail. As I moved through the hallway, I felt a strange chill in the air. It was odd because it was the middle of summer and the house had no air conditioning. I brushed it off as nerves. This was my first time filming a house alone and I wanted everything to be perfect. I walked into the last room, the master bedroom, which had a beautiful view of the backyard. I started recording, panning slowly from the window to the bed. 
That's when I saw it, just for a split second. In the reflection of the mirror on the wall, a figure stood behind me. I gasped and spun around, but the room was empty. My heart raced as I tried to calm myself down. It's just your imagination, I whispered. I checked the mirror again, but there was nothing there. Still, the image was clear in my mind. A woman, dressed in old-fashioned clothes, with a sad look on her face. I finished filming quickly, eager to leave the house. But as I walked down the stairs, I felt the cold air again. I turned the corner into the living room, and there she was, standing in front of the fireplace, just as I had seen in the mirror. She didn't move, didn't make a sound. She just stared at me. My hands shook as I fumbled for the door. I wasn't sure what I had seen, but I knew I needed to get out. I rushed outside, slamming the door behind me. As I stood on the front porch, catching my breath, I glanced back through the window. The woman was gone. I never told anyone about the ghost in the house. I sold it a few weeks later, and the new owners seemed happy. But every time I drive by that house, I can't help but wonder if they've seen her too.